Um, why don't we get started? Um, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the Business of Design interview series. Um, this is a series of interviews with some of the industry's leading designers and visionaries so we can hear about how they've grown their teams, expanded into new business areas, leveraged new marketing techniques, and so much more. Um, I'm Rachel Wagman from Studio Designer, and we're really so pleased to produce this series to mark the 10th anniversary of our CEO, Keith Granite's important book, The Business of Design. And if anyone is interested in purchasing a copy of this new book coming to market in a couple of weeks, please reach out for some special pricing. Go to the next slide, please. So we know that many of our customers are joining us today, but for those who may not know us, um, Studio Designer is the leading digital project management, product sourcing, and accounting platform for the interior design industry. Our fully integrated platform features all-in-one project management system, client collaboration portal, product sourcing tools, and designer-specific accounting software. Um, so um, bulk of our time today is gonna be um, for the main event where Keith will be interviewing um, our wonderful guest, Suzanne Kassler. Um, but, um, if you have any questions during the course of the interview, please submit them by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And we will read the questions um, at the end. So I'm gonna pass it over to Keith to introduce Suzanne and then we'll get the interview underway. Thank you, Rachel. Welcome everybody. Welcome to this new series. We're really excited about it. I'm thrilled today to introduce to you Suzanne Kassler, which probably needs no introduction. Um, Suzanne's a very talented product and interior designer who I've had the privilege of working with for the last 14 years. Um, so I'd like to actually call her more my friend than her my client. Um, we've traveled the world together and um, I've watched her career expand tremendously and um, putting all that talent to work. So it, it's been a very exciting time and um, just thrilled to have you here, Suzanne. So welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. It yeah. is hard to believe it's been 14 years, very exciting 14 years in our industry. Right. And we haven't aged a bit, right? What was actually more exciting is that we actually got to see each other last week at High Point which we haven't seen each other in a while because of the pandemic. So that was really refreshing. It was so fun to see you in person and really interact in person. And it was exciting really to see um, the energy and how busy and really um, that we can all see that things are gonna come back to a, uh, a new normal and also how much is happening in our industry really. Yeah, it's... It's amazing that, you know, we sort of joke with everyone that we're a COVID positive industry um, because so many people spend so much time paying attention to their home, whether they needed to buy a pillow or, re or build a new house. And everyone has been sort of swamped with work and uh, it's pretty remarkable, uh, but it actually feels good. Um, now we just have to get our manufacturers and vendors to deliver, right? Right. I think the supply chain, keeping up with <clears throat> the design talent is going to be the challenge. Exactly. Well, let's jump into the questions. So um, you've had a fascinating career from starting, you know, in more of the commercial world in Indianapolis and eventually sort of morphing that into a residential practice. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, it is interesting in design school and I went to the University of Cincinnati in interior architecture. Um, their training really is in mostly commercial design. I don't know that there's a lot of focus on training in residential. Even when I interview some of the young students coming out, that is kind of the focus. So the natural transition, I went into commercial design. But what happens in commercial design, your clients that are doing commercial projects, a lot of times will ask, <clears throat> those designers to work on residential. And I kept having 
a strong you know, love of doing the residential parts of those projects. There's a lot more interaction with the individual people. I always loved art and antiques and more individual furniture. And it just was a whole different way of working. So I kind of um, kept seeing myself loving the residential work. And I met my husband, John, who was a vice president at Steelcase. Obviously, we're in that commercial world. We, and we moved to Atlanta because of his job, which has been over 20 years ago. I decided to completely close out my commercial business and only focus on high-end residential. And you had said that even when you were doing commercial, that the that those clients also wanted a more residential feel, right? Um, so there was, you had sort of a pension for, you know, staying in that world, even at that point. I, even in my commercial world, I always specialized in, you know, at the time, over 20 years ago, law firms and other businesses, you know, they were starting to appreciate how interiors is part of branding yourself and attracting the right talent. And so even when we were doing commercial work, I always try to bring it into a more special focus and, and bring, you know, what we all know today, how design and good design really has a longevity in making something more valuable because it does kind of in a three-dimensional way present yourself in a business kind of environment. And we've seen that, you know, explode over the number of years. And one thing that's happened with our social media today, so many clients and just, I think the world really has appreciated good design and what it means for making not only their lives, you know, more successful or, you know, kind of better. When you made the transition, um, was it hard to find clients when you weren't used to sort of working with the residential or were some of those commercial clients becoming residential clients as well? Well, in Indianapolis, my commercial clients uh, were, were residential clients by now. And when I did move to Atlanta, the projects I kept were the residential part. I kept them, just their residences. And I had decided, you know, it was, um, we moved here in the, in the early 90s, I guess that's 20 years ago. And it, the commercial world was being hit. You know, we go through very many ups and downs in our industry. And so it was quieting down. It was kind of a good way to transition. Also, we had a new baby and I didn't want the schedule of commercial design. I wanted a more flexible schedule. So it was a great time for me to work on the commercial, I mean, the residential clients I had in Indianapolis that live here in Atlanta. And one thing that's unique about the South is the love of home. And there's so much and so many talented residential architects just in this community of the Southeast. And when I moved here, that was kind of a surprise to me. Coming from the Midwest, um, there wasn't the focus. It was much more of a contract focus. I always call, think of Chicago, the Neocon City, you know, that contract market. Right. So it was, um, I immediately started meeting some of the residential architects here and really developing the business. So it was really a great opportunity. And I will tell you that I look when I interview, having a commercial background is a huge positive for residential to design today because it is a big business. And, the, and that's kind of tying into this whole <clears throat> studio design platform. You have to run your business, you know, with the CPA and the business side. That is the only way you can really be successful. Because residential design um, is much like commercial design. So that background was really invaluable for me starting a residential business here. That's great. So when we first met, you really wanted to get start getting into product. Um, and now today, 14 years later, you know, you're, you know, one of my most successful clients in that area. What, what about your product do you think is so appealing to people? Because it's, it is widely uh, in, inspirational and, and recognizable and does so well. It was interesting. Um, I 
probably was most inspired by Barbara Berry early on in my career because she was this um, amazing interior designer and I was doing interior design. <clears throat> but I think like a lot of designers, we're always custom thinking of pro product. And I was watching how she had translated her design ideas into product and had kind of made that a dimension of her business. And I remember looking for you for many years. Uh, I know you knew Barbara and at least um, that whole world early on was kind of unique in LA. And I felt like, I remember sending a little notebook even years ago to another company on my own of sketches of furniture, no one ever answered. So I, I uh, literally was talking to some of my other architect friends. They knew of you as someone that helps design people really make a strategic plan. I think you were doing a lot of strategic plans in business side of architecture and design, but you also were helping people connect with some of the product people. Because I think as a designer, what, the, what you underestimate is the business side of our business. So here I had the commercial background that I was bringing to my business. I had some of the skill set of setting of structuring my residential business as a commercial business. And now I was going to be able to hire an agent. And I will tell you, I had to talk teeth into hiring me because I did not live in New York or LA. I do remember that. But I also remember <laughs> making you fly to New York to, to meet with me. <laughs> And yes. you showed me your work, and I was like, yes, let's do this. So, you know, it may have taken it's a little convincing. Evolution. But, but I, I think that one thing that um, I talk to designers about, and when they, because everyone wants to mention in their business, but the product design, what was happening for me, I always love everything, and designers are always shoppers. So I'm finding pieces of furniture and objects and I would buy them and inevitably either I would want to use that piece in a design project or they someone would want to buy it but I didn't want to sell it it was kind of my personal collection designers can we can always buy whimsical things for our own collections that maybe we don't think at first of using in a project so that was happening so often that I realized there really that I really did have this Kind of an eye for noticing what people might want in their projects or what i might want them to use in their projects so that really was the start of how product for me started you know i said i really want to do product and and it wasn't and i don't and so i don't know how that kind of unfolded it was kind of early on and you really encouraged me to put things into a more business kind of way so we could present it where they people would understand the different and we did make a list of all the people I might ever want to be involved with and it was interesting it was four or five people and we ended up with partners in all of those with all of those people eventually yeah well I do remember you said well the only one I want to work with is Hickory Chair I'm like oh great <laughs> you're making it so easy on me <laughs> and it worked out yeah. it's like you know um, you know, I often say to designers that even if they want to do product, it's important to keep your design practice going because it is your sandbox to experiment with custom product. And I think you found that as well, that you can have a custom client or an individual client where you want to do custom pieces that can inspire you to then bring things into your product lines. Do you think that's yeah, true? Yeah, I, I do think, yeah having a passion for design, and my passion really is homes. I mean, I dream of homes. I really feel it is my passion. Um, but I do feel that, that I'm always thinking of not only what I need, I really love designing and sharing ideas for other people, other designers. And, and it's really been um, interesting to see how people really have, I love to design things that people can make their own. I mean, that's what I really try to do and think about all the time. Because even though we want to have something even for our own projects, you know, we want to make it look different in the next project. So I, I do think about that often when I'm working on 
designing products, but I think my passion and always doing the interior design business of my business is probably the main part of our business and staying really involved in that with my clients and designers, I think has really been part of the success of my product business. Yeah, I would agree. So if a young designer came to you and said, I really want to get into product design, what advice would you give them? One thing as a young designer, you're still developing what I, what they always would ask me as a young designer, what is your signature style? Mm -hmm. What is your kind of philosophy? And one of the things that's a challenge is when you're young, you're absorbing a lot of things. And I think evolving and kind of making or creating a style that eventually I always talk about being authentic. But when you're really young, I notice that you do really evolve maybe more. I'm still always trying to evolve and unfold in my work. But I do think what's been important right now, there's so much noise in our world. There's so much of what's been, you know, what's really in right now, what's really popular right now, what's really resonating right now, that you really do have to pull in and decide what is my personal authentic message that I want to share. And even if you kind of take pieces from other things that inspire you, I think that having a curiosity and an enthusiasm for pretty much everything inspires our product. But it's important to be able to pull it back in because when you do go to do either your product, you know, showing new product or your presenting a collection to someone, you really have to have it be you and have an authenticity. Or there's so much noise in our industry, it can get diffused and you won't be able to root what they call like making your, your, your product really make a difference in their collections. Right. Well, it's, it, it's finding your differentiator, right? But what sets you apart? And I think what you're saying is, it has to be authentic. It has to be you. Otherwise, it tends not to be a differentiator. Right. And that's kind of what's happening a lot right now in product design and really in the interior design world. We're all influenced and mm. inspired, I call it, by so much. And with social media today, you know, we never had so much kind of we could be inspired from. It's exciting but then you have to kind of figure out what makes it kind of work into your own um, signature, really. Yeah, it's been pretty amazing what the, uh, the change in social media has done, especially Instagram. You know, in my new book, which is a update of the original book, Business of Design, 10 years ago, we didn't even talk about social media because it wasn't right. a thing. It was like, how do I get to the magazines? How do I get published? And now it's, you know, such a major influence on, you know, everything from buying product to just seeing what everyone's up to and, you know, having all that FOMO everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it is. There, like I always call it a lot of noise. And yet at the time, I really look at it as a lot of inspiration. <clears throat> but I do think that finding the right place for that is, it's, it's kind of a challenge for um, the design community today. And at the same time, you know, the sharing has made, um, like, just like we said, you started connecting our entire industry with all of our design leadership groups. Um, it, it really has made it priceless in the way that we connect and made our industry so much stronger and really more fun and interesting. So there's so many more positives. I just was saying when you're, but I do think that that, and it's not all bad when you're a young designer to keep evolving and having your style kind of unfold. But I do think staying true to who you are is an important part of what will be successful. I agree. So switching gears, um, let me just talk about the studio a little bit. So you've used studio for a long time. 
And um, how do you think it's made a difference in your business? Well, I do think the funniest story is how I discovered Studio. And this is how long ago the world has evolved. I remember moving into our new offices and we were figuring we'd been in our new offices in Atlanta for about 15 years. Mm-hmm. And I remember we were using another um, you know, kind of computer system for all of our work. Remember, I was coming from commercial, evolving into residential at that time. And so a fax came through and, we, and the office almost laughs about having a fax come through. And I happened to be at the fax machine and it was a fax talking about studio designer, but it listed all these really big names that were using it. And I literally had been having so many frustrations about our computer system because as we know, the residential part of the design business is very different than commercial in its complexities. And so when I saw this, I literally went into our CPA and I said, we are going to do this. And I I just laughed because um, that's kind of how long ago it was that we found Studio Designer. And it has been, we immediately went on the system and it really kind of changed how we were able to do everything, really. And um, I know that what's been interesting and fascinating since you all have bought into the company, you know, the focus on keeping things updated and adding to it and the dimensions of things that we're all able to do as really the whole computer world has exploded and the technology that we all are finding, it's kind of like the social media part of our business. Staying in tune and up to date is, it, it's the only way we can all stay relevant and you know, work with our clients in the right way. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's constantly an evolution, not only just from technology changes, but from what designers need. And there are a lot of new features we're working on um, you know, everything from enhancing a client portal to be able to make payments, which became very important during the pandemic, where people didn't want to even touch checks, um, to a new vendor portal that we're introducing. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things. Do you, can you think of tools that, you know, you would love to see if you, um, you know, if we were to expand to other areas? Well, one of the things you and I talked about when- we were at high point and that I talk to my designers about often we're putting together both storyboards or inspiration boards on our computer system mm-hmm. and we're tagging them numbering them with our proposals and we we did so much of this during the zoom I think the zoom meetings which a lot of us ended up finding out were very successful but certainly a very different way of working that storyboard or inspiration board and I think you called it a mood board really we started seeing how important that was in organizing all of our concepts with a floor plan numbering that back to proposals and you were talking about how you're trying to put in place a whole program that would translate that into orders pretty quickly and what was what a more interactive way that the client that's looking at these, they obviously want to know the price and, and you know all the details, and they want more interaction. And it was it was kind of interesting how you were explaining that that's one of the things you guys are working on right now. Yeah, we we have found that that need because and you're right. I think COVID definitely put it into the fast lane to be able to show your clients, you know, images and boards so they didn't have to travel and you could share that. And we thought, well, if it's an earlier part of studio's process where you can show everybody, you know, all the options, including just maybe even inspirational images, not just all product, that when a client liked something, they could click on it and it would pop all that data immediately into a proposal at studio so that you could get it approved and paid for and turned into a purchase order. So closing that loop from sort of inspiration into actually working on your orders would be, you know, phenomenal. And so we are in the process of figuring that out and building something like that. Well, the technology part of our world, um, we were saying now, we all kind of talked about it. We might have out of, our meetings today, we might have four meetings 
and maybe one is in person and then three will be on zoom mm -hmm. and it's kind of made it a lot more um, one thing is you notice when we're on zoom you do really have to focus i think when we had meetings that were not on zoom there's a lot of other conversations that happen in between so we were finding that it can be a really pretty intense efficient way of working and so much was getting done the only thing we're struggling with now is we can't meet with the clients every week on zoom it was kind of like they really kind of liked it i think things things will change as they start traveling but it's fun, it's funny to me how they all started thinking we could meet every week on Zoom. When we used to see them maybe once a month, you know, a new client. But I do, I will say, um, you know, taking out that travel component, but just the focus that you have when you're on camera with someone. And I think this technology that Studio Design is giving us as part of what we're presenting is really important and has made us even realize it's more important for our future to have more dimension with how studio designer interacts with our zoom meetings. Yeah, for sure. And I think that what we will consider that when we're, um, you know, when we're going through this, uh, as we build it, it's like, how do we not just make it, you know, um, a, a mood board or an inspiration board, but actually could be part of a conversation during a client meeting where, you know, you can actually see movement and talk and share the mood board and then actually come back and finish and move it into your product schedule. So yeah, clients are liking that interactive um, way of working. And I do think that's kind of an interesting concept that you're looking at incorporating. Yeah, when you said that Zoom is exhausting, it, it truly is. I mean, I find most of my days of First of all, I don't like looking at myself so much during the day. No, like, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it is because you have to focus. It's like, you know, and when you're in a meeting, you're like, I'll be right back. I have to go to the restroom or I want a glass of water. And I go to the bathroom. Do any of that. We, we realized, and we had to, we, not only did I have to um, kind of set up a backdrop here in our office, it's quiet for our Zoom calls. Um, and we have lights in front of me that kind of try to diffuse some of the natural light. But we've had our clients, we, we were laughing, they're doing these Zoom calls. We had to go and finish, you know, doing the library shelves behind them. We literally were designing a new office for a client and we had to talk about how his computer, what background was going to be happening when he's on his computer. Because I do think it's going to be the way of our future. So it's funny how these things happen in our world and they really kind of change our focus on some of those design details. That's interesting. I didn't even think about that. Um, but it's true. I moved, I moved my home office into my den where I could have a better background than seeing a bed right. that was in the spare room. Yes, we, we saw a lot of that early on in Zoom. And it was kind of upsetting. And everybody <laughs> kind of reacted, especially designers. So it's been, I kind of think that's been a, um, all the clients that we talk about it when we're, when they're now, everyone's going to work from home part of the time. And I think it's going to, it's definitely, like you said, accelerated the way we're working and then having the technology. I always talk about that with our, our, our the, all the designers that having that in your office technology, whether it's studio design or whatever we are doing, I mean, it's such an important part so you can actually grow your business. Yeah. Um, you know, early on when the pandemic first hit, we actually did a, at studio, we did a Zoom uh, background competition. And people had oh. a <laughs> background. And I forgot the winner got something. I think they got some free software. Oh, your free book. If you probably sent them your book. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. But I think they got a, a six months of use of studio or something. Um, but it was fun because people were really creative about their backgrounds. Um, so um, you've written lots of books. Now, I think you're on your fourth book, right? Yes, we're working on our fourth book. Um, you've been very, published. very exciting. You've been published, you know, in every major shelter magazine. You've traveled with me, certainly, around the world. Um, the world. Yeah. The world, literally, right? Every, I think we're, we've covered five continents or four continents. Um, what do you, um, where do you find your inspiration when it comes to looking for new ideas? 
I think that the thing that's really important as a designer is to keep really enthusiastic and curious. You know, we see so much, we travel a lot. And what I found is that I always have to really, I really love pretty much going everywhere and what I see. I will love going and seeing, I always talk about the high low. And you know, we see this certainly more literally in France. You know, you can go to the, obviously the flea market where things actually, it's high because everything's surprisingly expensive, but you can go in the tiniest shops and find creativity. But I find I can be locally and go anywhere. I love to, um, when I had free time when we were out more, you know, I love fashion and I love to go to some of the young shops and certainly the designer shops. I love, you know, what we love translating is things that are not interior design into not only our product, but into our interiors. So I think the thing, the key thing I would stress is staying enthusiastic and curious and also appreciating, you know, I mean, we, I know all the designer friends I know, we can go to Target and get excited. Um, whereas we can go to the most beautiful high-end Dior store, my favorite, um, and also be excited. So I think it's important as designers that we, and certainly for me, I stay related to everything in design. And I think it's important um, that to, to stay relevant. And so I obviously, when we talk about what's inspirational, all designers, it's always travel and fashion. It seems to be a huge part of it. But, you know, I do love um, that part of Instagram um, that I'm seeing all the different pictures that I get really inspired by a lot of it. Yeah. I mean, I, I hear that all the time. I mean, that's why, you know, leaders of design that's traveled all over the world for that reason. Because, you know, I remember um, that when we were in Marrakesh, seeing like two years later, half the magazines, you could see the inspiration from those trips. It's and really it's, you know, same yeah. with Kyoto. It's like, we're seeing that again. So speaking of leaders of design, you've been an important part of that and you've been really supportive. You sat on our cabinet of advisors. What has it meant to you to be a part of that organization? Well, when we talked about it this year, um, um, I talked about it as really being priceless, really, for me. Um, I think uh, the relationships, when I met you and you, not only we talked about, you know, worked on it from a business side of it, but that whole idea of connecting our community. So the leaders of design, as many of you know, we, they set up trips, usually a European trip in the once a year, but other smaller trips. Uh, where we really can have business information. So for me, it wasn't just the travel. Every year I would go on the trip, it's really a bit time I would evaluate my business. And I would sit and listen to the business speakers and make notes, but be thinking of my own office. Because you always would bring in people that are experts at different things. And whether they related to my own industry or Sometimes there are speakers about what's happening. I'll never forget that when we were in Copenhagen, hearing Brooke speak about all the environmental things, and certainly we've seen the impact that their firm has had. I think that those things start, you kind of start bringing those into your, the little bits into your own. So it wasn't just the travel, which we get inspired for design, the friendships, which now we, I really feel like I could go anywhere in the country, call someone. And they will share with me. I will see them. We might have dinner. We, I need a resource. But also, I really felt the business things that were happening is so important. Because you are really in a, like a seminar part of the time. And you're really working. And so I would spend that time working. So I just kind of think it's been invaluable to me. And it's kept me relevant. Kept, kept me inspired. I remember the year that when everyone lost all their business, we were all, I think, in Venice. Designers have no money and they will spend it on travel. As you know, we all had lost it that year that everyone, the business was terrible. We all managed to get to Venice together and commiserate about 
probably none of us had any work. But it's interesting that sharing and inspiring and it's just, I don't know, it's just been, it's just been the best, the best part. It's, it's so true because the year before that, which is when 09, you know, hit everybody and we were in New Orleans and I said, our next trip is going to be Venice. And my partners at the time were like, no one's coming to Venice. Nobody has any money. I said, if they have two nickels to rub together, they'll be in Venice and 200 people showed up in Venice. It, that was to me the funniest because really we all commiserated how everyone had lost, you know, pretty much most of their business that year. And we were all there and it was, you know, as again, amazing. But I, I do think that, that that's what I was saying about um, you can't really put a, put a, put a number on how, what the impact of that does for all of us. And um, so I, I just, I, I just love the memories and also what it's done in terms of the success of, our industry really, um, we have a very strong industry that really we share a lot of business ideas and they continue to in unfold and evolve because we've technology hit us all kind of in this last um, 10 years. And just like we were saying, the studio, whether it's studio design, traveling, how do you keep all that and kind of process it and still stay kind of as an individual authentic designer? Right. Well, you know, I, I hear time and time again how people have met people, they wouldn't have had projects, they wouldn't have had the connections, they wouldn't have had the friendships had it not been for those trips. And I also think that we've learned as we've morphed through the years with leaders of design that we believe in a lifetime of learning. And I think you're a perfect example of that. You're always a student to constantly stay relevant and be evolving. And I think that's what makes designers you know, create legacies and, and continue on with their practices if, if they were all constantly learning because the world changes so fast and even faster now. So last question for you. Is there any products or product projects that you haven't done that you would love to do? You've done a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's like, um, you know, what is your you know, favorite product, product project or product? Um, you know, right now, I feel like I am in this really great place. Um, I have seven partners that I do product for, and I have a really wonderful, amazing design office of 12, which I like that size. And there are four people, three of them have been with me over 17 years you know. So I really feel like, and at the same time, we're still really energized and excited and passionate. So I really, I think the key thing is um, for all of us is just having, keeping that enthusiasm for all that we're doing. And I, I think what I wanted to do, and it's kind of happened, what I put out there is I love working with the really great architects working. To me, it's all about architecture. I love architecture and landscape architecture. And as being part of a team, I love collaboration. And even with my, whether it's a product partner, I like it the most, but with the architects, I put out there a few years ago, I just wanted to work on projects with the really wonderful talented architects. And to me, um, that's kind of been my focus. That's great. So I, I don't think we reminded people when we started this uh, interview series that you can ask questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom thing where you'll see Q&A. If you just type it in, we'll ask it. But I know we have a couple in the, who have asked some questions. So let's see what the audience wants to ask us. Um, Lauren, do you want to, um, or Rachel, ask the questions? I can. Um, we have an, actually an early question from Miriam, who is asking, how did Suzanne get started with creating furniture and fabric? Did she reach out to vendors or did they come to her? Um, Suzanne, you want to answer that? Well, um, what we did is, um, what Keith talked to me about when I told him I wanted to do product, as I mentioned, I think I sent my little, um, drawing sketch book out and no one responded. So what happens is um, today it's very different. I think that all the product 
people have understood the importance of good design in a different way. But years ago, when I was with Keith, he said to me, we need a plan. We need a strategic plan. And you have to have a very developed concept of what you're going to bring. And then it was really great to have an introduction. Sometimes it's hard as a designer to just call and sell yourself directly. And I found that to be a really invaluable part for me. And, and Keith talking about it, how it really is a business. And as much as I'm wanting to share my creative side, I'm so excited and anxious to make these products or ideas to bring, how we really needed to have it be more structured and more defined. And so we really, that's how kind of how we did it. I will say today, I think it's a little different, don't you, Keith? Um, the, the product people and the designers, there's a lot more designers doing product. The uh, people, clients have seen how that's had a positive impact. It's a, it's a good thing, and, a, and sometimes they're doing, you know, their commitment to the designers is more capsule collections than mm -hmm. a long-term relationship. Um, it's kind of different, but there's lots of opportunities that it has unfolded a little differently today than it might have been in the past. I don't know. What is your, what do you see on that side? I, you know, I've always said that you want to be sh make sure that you're sort of not the flavor of the month for somebody where you, know, you come in and do a product and then the next season they pick somebody else because then you have no longevity, it has no legs. And the goal should be to build something that, you know, we, we just talked about what Hickory Chairs now been 12 years. I mean, that's what you wanna build is a long, kind of long runway so that you, know, it, you get that residual value and it also makes you more relevant to um, be there. I mean, we did the Barbara Berry deal at Baker 30 years ago, I think it's been or 28 years ago. I mean, and she's still there and still selling. So that's what I tell people is you really want to find a company that believes in you and wants to do this for the long haul and not something that's short lived. Thanks so much, Suzanne and Keith. I have a question from Sarah. She's asking, how many people work for you and did you start your firm alone? Um, yes, I, well, I, I, when I was in Indianapolis, I worked for another designer before starting my own, but um, I was, um, I decided to start my own business just on my own. I, um, I don't know, I was pretty independent at the time. And um, then when I came to Atlanta, I, it was interesting. I went and interviewed. I thought, well, maybe I'll just go work for someone. But by then I'd already had my own business and had no one would hire me actually. So I decided to start my own again. And one of the things um, I always tell people when you're starting your own business to be sure and do a show house. That is the best way to start your business. You'll meet not only clients maybe, and they'll give you the littlest room, but you also meet other people in the community. And that's, there's a lot of energy in that and helping you establish a new business. Cause I moved you know, to a new city to start my own business. But I, um, I really don't have, I have people that, um, I have vice presidents of my office. I have a CPA and I have a senior vice president and I have a, um, two people in my, have two people in my marketing department. I have a marketing director, but I really, um, it is a firm that is my, my office. Awesome. I have a question um, from a small interior design firm who is wondering, what is your take on a small firm opening a small showroom? Would you separate the name of the firm and the showroom? Do you have any advice about the lines you would carry in a showroom? Every designer I know, including myself, wants to open a store at one time or another in their design career. I never heard Actually, that. Actually, I, <laughs> I had mine in Indianapolis, a small store. Um, and what I've done with my business, even with my product business, um, it is great. I will tell you, if you have a store and you have your design studio in the store, it's a great way to get new clients. If you move to a new city and you want to just get clients, if you open a showroom or a store that kind of shows your little signature style, people like that. They can kind of come in and test you out maybe meet you. I think it's always important for them to know you have a design business as part of that. 
Um, so you can separate the business, the, you know, paperwork wise, like you could have a showroom that has a different business and your like my product business is in a separate business, but at the same time you can be in the same environment. There is a synergy with having that environment and having your studio. And the person I think of often with that is Thomas O'Brien, who has his store, Arrow, but he also, he's been a great friend and mentor to me. He also has his um, design studio kind of behind the scenes. It's, a great, it's kind of a great energy and people like that. They kind of see your signature and it's kind of a great way to do it. I would say I hear it all the time, you know, can I, but I remind people, it depends on what kind of store you want, because if you need to be open all weekend, you have to think about that. Um, but there can be a lot of synergy. There's a great store here in LA called Grace Home and people go in and buy, but then they talk to the owners all the time about, and they do more probably decorating in their clients' houses than they do from the store. Um, but it is definitely um, a way to sort of build a business. It just is a big commitment to be retail. Thanks so much. I have a question from Shai Lee. She's asking, when starting off a new interior design business, how do you recommend billing the clients? Well, I think that that part of our business, um, I actually go to seminars with Keith and his group to listen about how people are charging for our business. I do think it's very really individual, um, and it seems to be individual in different areas. I think today, um, the, the key thing that everyone always talks about is, you know, do you charge hourly, do you do, do a flat fee? And, you know, even in my world here in Atlanta, so many designers, we do it all very differently. So I don't know that there's one thing that's good for any one person. Um, I personally um, do a more of a flat fee based for my work um, and hourly only for certain parts of the work. And then we are doing, you know, markups on furniture and things. But I think that I know a lot of designers are charging hourly. So that question I might send over to Keith. He might have more insight into it because so many different companies work very differently and it depends on kind of the job. Right. Well, like you said, Suzanne, I think that if you ask 10 designers, you get 10 different answers of how they bill. Mm -hmm. I would say the most important thing is to be as professional about it as possible and make sure you're sending out your billing every month. You're not waiting, you know, and then sending a lump sum bill in six months when you need some money. I mean, clients want you to, it's a business and you need to treat it like a business. I would say that in a few cities, Chicago, San Francisco, Boston, they tend to bill hourly for everything, plus a markup. Where in LA and New York, I think in Atlanta, it probably goes both ways. There's more of a, a fee structure. So you, you're getting a lump sum, and then you're also charging a markup. And you might charge hourly for you know the work with the architect or any consulting like that. Um, but I, I think the biggest message to send is, make sure your client realizes you're running a business and that your billing is as important and don't be afraid to ask for, you know, a reasonable amount of money because you should be paid for what you do. You should be paid for your talent. Great. Thank you. I have a question from Paige. She's, she, and she's a mother daughter team of two and they're looking to bring on new employees. She's curious about the sequence of roles and employees you filled while growing your business. What areas did you find beneficial to have your team expand in those early years to be more productive and lucrative overall? Well, the first thing I really tell people they need to hire is the you know, CPA or um, business person. And designers can uh, continue to be surprised me how they underestimate that part of our business. You know, our clients are investing a lot of money. Our business is very complex. There's a lot of dimensions to our business. And, uh, I have a full-time CPA and they are there every day. And I'm always surprised how designers do not understand that is to me, I, it is the most important part of our business. It, it, it gives us the freedom to be creative. It also helps make sure that you are making the money where you're supposed to be making the money. There's just so many little details and loose ends that are hard to track all the time. 
So that probably is my biggest thing that I talk to people about when I'm starting a business. And then I've noticed that other people that come into your business, um, the design people that you need, sometimes come into the business differently. You might interview someone and they're the right fit, and you kind of create a job for them. Um, I think that that unfolds later. I just can't stress enough the business side of the business, and Keith has been the one that started that early on. I started it even before I met him, and he reinforced it, and really actually has, I think, helped so many designers over the years strengthen that focus. Yeah, I, you know, I said one of the, one of the joys I would say of working with you is that you do understand the business, and you know you are a good businesswoman, um, despite all your talent and everything else. I think you you know you know how to run a business. It makes life easier. You know our our um, vision at Studio Designer is to empower creativity because we believe if you have good business systems in place, it actually makes you more creative. Then you don't worry about where that next project's coming from or how you're gonna pay the rent or how you're gonna make payroll. If you've got good systems in place, it lets you sleep at night and therefore make you more creative. And without that, it's just a hectic, chaotic world. Thanks so much. I think we have time for a couple more questions. I have one from Angela. It's a, she has a bit of a story. She says that when she was a kid, Suzanne, you designed my dad's law firm in Indianapolis, and I still remember the grand opening. Everyone else was designing law offices that were dark and stuffy, and your design was light and airy and filled with art. So inspirational. I'm now an interior designer in Portland, and I think of that moment when the glass doors opened on your design and how magical that felt. How do you convince lawyers to take a chance on a design that was so outside the box? What a great story. <laughs> Well, what was interesting about that law firm is for 20 years, they replicated that design on every floor that they added on as they grew. And, one of, and my inspiration, I will tell you, was I went to Chicago and stayed at, you know, I don't know if it was the Four Seasons, but I would always travel as a young designer with no money and stay at the nicest place, hotels. And um, I don't know if it was Trish Wilson's firm. But the hospitality design inspired me the most of those, in those days because they were doing the most beautiful, luxurious projects. And even though I didn't even have any money, I would go to Chicago and I stayed, and I stayed at the hotel. I, again, they've changed names so many times, I don't know if it was the Four Seasons. But, and I remember people saying, I can't believe you're staying at the Four Seasons. But I would study all the details in hospitality. And I decided that the law firms should have those same details in their law firms. And the other thing is, I worked on that law firm and I said, we need to have the hallways be working hallways. Because you know, they have these huge long hallways. And at the time there was paper. And they would have so much paper in those law firms, you cannot imagine. And we designed the most beautiful hallways of wood lined bookcases beautifully detailed, like those hospitality wood paneled rooms, but behind them would be all the storage for all the law firms. So not only was I able to talk to them about, have it not only function for them in ways that we were using all the different square footage ideas, but we were making them where people, they wanted to attract the talent for their firm. And I talk about that today. You, your environment is your brand. And you know, branding today is so important. But even early on, somehow I knew that. I always talk about design makes a difference in your life. And so I really literally was doing, at the time, I was doing all these law firms. And that design, the only thing I regret is selling them the original collection of Joseph Albers prints. They probably still have. I hope they know how valuable they are today. <laughs> but that is a great story. And I actually love that story. Thank you so much for sharing. That makes me so happy because I think making designers make the world such a better place. And hearing that story is really probably so special to me. That's great. Um, you know, I'm sure you hear this because I hear it all the time that when clients travel, they come back and say, oh, I just stayed at the peninsula and I love the, you know, the 
the dressing room there, or I love this part of the bathroom, because that's what they get exposed to. Um, or they come back in the middle, I know that I've heard a lot of architects say, they come back in the middle of construction, like, I want my terrace to be, you know, four feet deeper, because I love this feel that it had. And of course, they have to go back and have a change order and start doing that. Um, but I do think clients and many people get inspiration from hospitality. Great. I think we have time for just one more question. Um, Sharon's asking, what are your best recommendations to collaborate harmoniously with both builders and clients? <laughs> well, whenever a client comes to me or um, someone approaches us for design, it's, it's the best way is to get the team together all, all at once. The architect, the builder, the interior designer, and the landscape designer. We cannot forget that landscape designer. I, I just, it, it's so important the way people want to live inside and out today. And so after we are brought in as part of a member of the design team, we ask for a meeting with all of those people together so that we can then, and we always ask the architect or to kind of go through the whole, um, walk us through the whole project and the whole you know, concept that they're working on. I do think that that, starts a relationship because what you want we need the builder to be part of the team what we don't need and we've all been there is having the builder using saying they we didn't get something to them or we need or we're behind because it starts up this ad atmosphere that's not a positive and we have to remember i always tell my designers that clients hire designers because they love design or they would not go to this intense, you know, the intensity and the expense of hiring a design team. And so we need to make that process fun for them. And it's important that all of those people are getting along in that really collaborative way. So we found if we go have that meeting in the beginning, we all say, what do you want us to do? What do you want to do? What are we doing? And we keep them on that um, kind of connected path it has made for a much more fun. And then when there are problems, we all kind of can help each other get them solved. And there are always problems, as we know. I think it's, it's great advice. Um, it always surprises me when either it's an owner's rep or even a client who thinks that they want to put you in an adversarial role um, and compete against each other where when you are collaborative, the project's so much more successful. And you're right, when there's a problem, you're working it out together versus pointing fingers. Uh, so I, I think it's the, the fastest and the soonest way you can come up with a way to collaborate, the more successful a project becomes. Well, Suzanne, I think we, uh, we're at the end of our interview. <laughs> um, you know, I, I feel like I never get enough time with you because, you know, the world revol is revolving so fast. Uh, but we did have some really great time together in High Point. So I feel like we caught up a lot. But I really appreciate you being here. And I know that everyone who is listening to this loves hearing you and hearing, you know, your success and your advice because you are, you are a mentor to many, even if they don't know you, they're, you're a mentor and an inspiration for so many. So thank you. Thank you for having me. I love sharing. And I will say, I think it's such an exciting time for our, in, our industry and just um, having that passion and seeing such a, you know, people love design and, and we really do make a difference. Making the world more beautiful, it makes a difference in people's lives. Yes, thank you. Um, Lauren, do we want to tell everybody what the next interview is? Sure, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Rachel, I believe you're going to take it from here. Yep, can you spread that? Yeah. So, um, again, for those who want to learn more about Studio Designer, please visit us. Um, we'd love to talk to you about how you can leverage um, Studio Designer for your design business if you're not already. Um, and then we also want to um, promote the next couple of interviews we have coming up. Um, Suzanne will be a tough act to follow, <laughs> but we have several coming up. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
So please save the date um, for our upcoming interviews in um, over the next several months. Um, visit our website for some more information on how to register. Um, but thank you so much for everyone for joining and um, have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you guys, thank you. Thank you. Bye everybody.